Dr. Lilia Soto is an assistant professor in the American Studies program at the University of Wyoming. She uh, received her bachelor's degree in ethnic studies and Latin American studies at the University of California, San Diego. And she earned her PhD in comparative ethnic studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Before she came to the university, um, and uh, joined the American Studies and Chicano uh, Studies program. She was a University of California President's Doctoral Fellow at the University of California, Los Angeles in the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicana Chicano Studies. And she also taught at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the Feminist Studies Department. Dr. Soto's research and teaching interests uh, is centered uh, at the intersections of gender, age, time, and migration. And she has finished her book manuscript, but I know she's in the, <laughs> it is all off to the publishers. Uh, and her book uh, manuscript is entitled uh, Reading Between the Vines, uh, where age and gender intersect in peculiar areas in Napa Valley and dictate the journey north for teenage girls. At the University of Wyoming, and we're so pleased that Dr. Soto is at the University of Wyoming, she teaches courses such as American Cultural Diversity, U.S. Women of Color, and Women, Gender, and Migration. And today we have the privilege of learning from Professor Soto's expertise in her presentation entitled, Mexican America in the Napa Valley, Wine, Tourism, and Race in the Wine Country. Professor Soto. Uh, as Maggie said, uh, my talk is titled Mexican Americans in the Napa Valley, uh, Wine, Tourism, and Race in the Wine Country. And this is a new project. Um, and I should add, it's very much a work in progress. So any suggestions you have will be welcomed and greatly appreciated. Um, what I want to do with my talk today is highlight two moments in the Napa Valley narrative um, to trace a Mexican American presence. The first is in the late 19th century California, where I examine the lingering consequences of California, of uh, California, Mexican Napa, the numerous identities that point to the legacies of conquest, of um, interracial marriage, of memory, and of how such are negotiated. The second uh, is less researched, uh, but it situates contemporary Mexican immigration in Napa to the 1940s. These two moments, are, are, I argue, must be situated in the present as these point to a continuous and constant invisibility of Mexicans in Napa. So this project grew out of my first book manuscript, which as uh, uh, Maggie said, is currently under review and it actually has a, a, a different title and I'm sure the title will change again. And the current title is um, Impersonal Knowledge of Migration, uh, Imagination and Geographies in the Making of Migrants. Um, and it examines the links between Mexico and the US produced through migration as experienced by Mexican teenage girls raised in transnational families. It couples the temporalities of migration with gender, age, and sex as intersecting categories of analysis within transnational familial formation. With a focus on Mexican teenage girls, uh, the manuscript investigates their experiences and consequences growing up transnational. It examines, <coughs> excuse me, a very traditional familial arrangement, father away families into which Mexican teenage girls are born to provide, to provide a window into a subjectivity of people whose lives are affected by migratory journeys. Um, in the manuscript, I explore how girls develop subjective perceptions of time and place uh, that also point to unexamined areas within transnational migration, including waiting and the persistence of patriarchal and sexist migratory practices. Based on a multi-site comparative um, and interdisciplinary ethnography, uh, ethnographic study, the manuscript examines the lives of Mexican teenage girls in two separate locations, Napa, California, and the town of Sinape, Ecuador, in, this, in the state of Michoacan in Mexico during two separate time periods, 2006 and 2010, 2012, respectively. Uh, growing up in families with recurring mig migration practices makes uh, the girls' own migration seem inevitable. So upon researching the Napa Valley, I found Carolina Bale, and it is here where I begin with her story uh, in the first moment of the Napa Valley narrative that I would like to share with you. On March 3rd, 2012, the Charles Krug Winery in the Napa Valley, owned by Peter Mondavi, he recently passed away on February 20th, uh, 2016, at the age of 101. Uh, so at, at his winery, uh, at the Peter Mondavi uh, winery, his, uh, Peter Mondavi and his sons celebrated Charles Krug's birthday, and it was described, as you can see up here, as 
throwing a birthday party for everybody's uh, favorite Prussian revolutionary activist, entrepreneur, and founder of Napa's first winery, Charles Krug. The celebration at the Carriage House will include a number of special guests, including our good friend and spirit medium, uh, Leanne Thomas, who will attempt to channel Charles Krug to send him our, our sincere birthday wishes and possibly ask him a few questions. How often do you get to wish someone a happy 187th birthday? The evening will be a lot of fun and commence at 6 p.m. with appetizers, followed by a three-course dinner paired with exquisite Charles Krug wine. Tickets for the event were $100, and it was limited to 187 people to ensure that the event remained somewhat intimate. Uh, who is Charles Krug? Who is the Mandavi family? And what is the connection to Carolina Bale? As most of you are aware, Napa has become synonymous with wine, and particularly with internationally recognized California wine. There is a public television program that details something called Napa Style by Michael Chiarello. There is Napa Cooking, Napa, uh, <coughs> Napa Lifestyle, uh, a commonly distributed catalog, sells hyper-expensive Napa goods. That the place is a major tourist destination is clear, but its geography is perhaps a little less known. Le a little less known. So here are a few facts. The Napa Valley lies an hour northeast of San Francisco, and that is without traffic. <laughs> With traffic, it's an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Uh, tourists flock to the valley on weekends and holidays, intent on tasting and buying wine, eating at dozens of expensive gourmet restaurants, uh, shopping at hundreds of high-end designer shops, and indulging in various spa treatments. Napa, or so the tourist brochure tells us, provides a perfect weekend getaway for Northern Californians, as well as uh, a major tourist destination from people from all across the world. The Napa Valley, in fact, receives five to six million visitors per year. Um, and it is uh, the second most visited place in California. In case you're curious, Disneyland is number one. Uh, and uh, the Napa Valley is often re uh, referred to as a Disneyland for adults. Uh, the Napa Valley offers daily wine tours and tasting for those eager to learn about the art of fine wine and winemaking. What few tourists realize is that wine, as well as its ancillary industries, this depends on several factors invisible to the tourist eye. Of course, first is in, uh, environment itself. According to Jonathan Swinchad and David J. Howell, it is all in the terroir, the soil, the location, the weather, and the curvature of the land. This special environment allows grapes to grow at perfect temperature, which makes for some of the finest wine in the world. Not surprisingly, wine was grown in the valley from the earliest days of Spanish settlement, but only for the purpose of consumption. And it was actually Charles Cook himself who is credited as one of the first winemakers who made wine for consumption and production in what has been referred to as the Napa Valley heyday. <clears throat> Uh, that came uh, to an end during the years of prohibition, and I will come back to Krug in a second. For decades, all the locals enjoyed the produce of the vineyards. Few uh, beyond California's borders recognized the quality of wine, although I, am unaware, although I am aware that in the early 1900s, Napa Valley wine was already winning in world fairs. Uh, this coincides with the rise of U.S. empire. In fact, it was not until 1976 that Napa wine became, in fact, the Napa wine that we know today. Though it did not happen in Napa, it happened in Paris in May of that year. Concerned about the increasing influx of California's wine into the European market, British expert Stephen Spurrier sponsored a blind wine tasting contest called the Paris Wine Tasting of 1976, a test they fully expected would prove to everyone the superiority of French wine over those from across the water. To the horror and shock of every French person present, Napa Valley's 1973 Stag Sleep Wine Cellars Cabernet Sauvignon won the best red wine, while Chateau Montelena's 1973 Chardonnay won the best white. A, a film, as you may know, was actually made back in 2008 called Bottle Shock, which gives a visual representation of how Chateau uh, Montelena won what has been known as the Judgment of Paris. So these results, needless to say, put the Napa Valley on the international wine buyer's map, as Napa's wines were, er, were clearly as good as any French wine from Bordeaux or Burgundy. From, the moment on, uh, from that moment on, change was rapid in the valley. It is estimated that up to 400 wineries adorned the 30-mile length of the valley, or what is known as Up Valley. It includes series of what were once Sleepy Towns, Yountville, Oakville, Rutherford, St. Helena, and Calistoga, uh, wine tasting proliferated, soon restaurants and hotels followed. 
Napa's wines, once modest, uh, inexpensive table wines, drew high prices. In fact, at the Napa Valley Wine Auction in the year 2000, one bottle of red wine sold for half a million dollars. So this was a screaming uh, eagle wine considered uh, by most to be cold wine, and cold wine because there's only about 100 bottles that they make a year. So it becomes incredibly uh, expensive. Uh, the Napa Valley was obviously a, pra a place of tremendous wealth. Unlike Up Valley, on the other hand, the city of Napa was not a tourist destination until very recently. Uh, in the past years, however, entrepreneurs have figured out that the city can recreate, uh, can be recreated to rival uh, Up Valley destination. Fine restaurants have opened along the Napa River in downtown Napa with the aim of attracting tourists there too. Uh, in the late 1990s, Robert Mondavi donated $20 million to uh, construct Copia, the American Center for Wine, Food, and the Arts. Though Copia closed in 2008, it did help reshape Napa and bring, and bring businesses into downtown. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Oxbow Market. Um, oh, I lost my place. Uh, Oxbow Market modeled after the ferry building in San Francisco and boutique hotels that cater to a particular tourist. There are, however, many other sides to this story, and one of them has to do with economy and labor. Wherever the economy booms, labor is needed. For the Napa Valley's vintners, both in Up Valley and downtown, uh, hotel keepers and restaurateurs, it was Mexican labor that sustained existing industries and have allowed a rapid growth. Another story is uh, who are the people behind the Napa Valley? Perhaps one of the most famous names of the valley is that of Robert Mondavi, is that of the Mandavi family or the Mandavi family, depending on which winery uh, and which brother one is referring to, uh, known as one of the most prominent families in the valley. So the Napa Valley legacy, this Napa Valley legacy began with the family patriarch, Caesar Mondavi. So Caesar Mondavi arrived in the US in 1906 from Italy to the state of Minnesota, where uh, he had cousins living there. When we read and when we look at the boosterous literature that narrates his life, um, this literature makes no connection to the fact that the early 1900s was a period of anti-Southern and Eastern European migration culminating with the Immigration Act of 1924, which Cesar Mondavi would have been incredibly affected being of uh, Italian descent. Instead, Cesar Mondavi is presented as a hardworking, good businessman who traveled to it who returned to Italy in 1908 to marry Rosa Grassi and returned to Minnesota with her shortly after their marriage. As a winemaker at his home in Minnesota and as a member of the uh, Italian American wine, he was sent to California in uh, 1919 to purchase grapes. Of course, this was shortly before prohibition uh, and then after the grape uh, business became uh, incredibly profitable. By 1923, he relocated uh, his family to Lodi, California, and Cesar Mondavi began his grape growing business. His two older sons, Robert and Peter, uh, began working in the family business, and by 1943, the Mondavi family purchased a Charles Cook winery for $75,000, the winery that had once belonged to Charles Cook himself. Upon Cook's death, the winery became property of James K. Moffett, who sold it to Caesar, and to this day, the winery still belongs to the Mondavi family. It's one of the rare uh, uh, family-run wineries in, in Napa, as most of them were sold to bigger uh, corporations. So the fact that they purchased the Krug Winery became the marriage of two of the most well-known names in wine and winemaking in the Napa Valley. So what is the link between the Mondavi family and Carolina Bale, and who was Charles Krug himself? and I'm gonna to turn to Krug first, and this is a picture of him. Charles Krug, canonized in the narrative of the, of the valley, is credited as a winemaker who first made wine for consumption and production in the late 1860s. He is an immigrant from Trentoburg, near Prussia, who arrived in Philadelphia in 1847. By 1852, he became a US citizen and was living in San, in San Francisco, editing the first German newspaper of California. By 1858, he moved to the Sonoma uh, Valley and began planting vineyards. At the age of 35, he married Carolina Bale in 1860. She was 20 years old. He received 540 acres of land as part of the dowry in his marriage to Carolina Bale. Carolina Bale, the daughter of Edward Turner Bale and Maria Ignacia Soberanes, and Maria Ignacia Soberanes, um, these names matter a lot in California. Uh, Maria Ignacia Soberanes uh, is, was the daughter of Mariano Soberanes and Maria Isadora Vallejo, sister of California figure Mariano Vallejo. 
That's why they had a lot of land. Of the 500 acres of land, Krug used 20 acres to build his winery, the Charles Krug Winery, which was then called the Charles Krug Cellar, which allowed him the physical space to grow the grapes that make the wine. The Krug is Krug because of his, wife because of his wife's land. Her presence remains elusive, almost ghost-like, to use Avery Gordon's concept in her 1997 book called Ghostly Matters. Who is Carolina and why, if it was she who allowed Krug to become Krug, a name and a figure still very much present in the Napa Valley narrative, a, a name that brought, much, that brought much success to the Mandavis, why isn't she present? I became interested in her precisely for these reasons um, and, pre and precisely because of these questions. This is a picture of her. I stumbled upon her by accident. Interested in the Napa Valley context, I was researching books at the Bancroft Library at the UC Berkeley campus while I was writing my dissertation. Of course, most of the accounts mentioned Krug and his major accomplishments. Every single book I read, every magazine, every boosters account told the same narrative in relation to uh, Carolina Bale and to Charles Krug, his marriage, the dowry, and his successful career as a winemaker. I wondered, I wondered then why no one had noted that Krug is Krug because of Carolina and because of her dowry. The magazine Gleanings, published by the Napa County Historical Society, dedicated one of its volumes to Charles Krug. The Gleaning magazine narrated the same story and included the following description of Carolina Bale, quote, a large woman with well-cut features and dark complexion showing her Spanish blood, her voice was clear and pleasant. And that's all they say about her. So this short description reveals that she spoke English and makes references to her California background. So I wanted to know more. Who was she? What was she like? How did her life change when she married Krug? Did she self-identify as Californio or Californiana, as Maria Raquel Casas calls California women? And most importantly, why has she not been recognized in the Napa Valley narrative? Krug's material presence remains present via the winery in, that bears his name and birthday celebrations. Why is, what is her place in these celebratory events? My interest isn't simply to add and stir her name next to Krug, but to question the continuous erasure of Mexicans in the Napa Valley, an erasure that if highlighted would muddle the Valley's old world identity of Italian and German immigrants as the legacy and the roots of the wine country. Tracking her has not been easy, uh, and I still have a lot more research to do. For starters, the spelling of her name changes. She was born Carolina Bale. Upon her marriage to Charles Krug, she was often referred to as Mrs. Krug, and in some legal documents as Caroline B. Krug, Carolyn Bale or Carolina Krug, which in some ways erases her mixed race identity. The Edward Turner Bale family papers reveal that she was a product of an interracial uh, ethnic marriage between Edward Turner Bale and Maria Ignacia Soberanes. As historians of California history have told us, marriages between Euro-American males and California women were common. In fact, Maria Raquel Casas found that before the Mexican-American War, there were approximately 200 documented marriages between Californianas and Euro-American men. The marriages, as Casas states, were not what Hubert Howe Bancroft reported. Bancroft, uh, Casas states, quote, was reflecting 19th century socio-racial ideologies that asserted that Californianas, before the Mexican-American War, readily preferred Euro-Americans as mates and partners because of the physical, moral, spiritual, and cultural deficiencies that women were alleged to perceive among their own California menfolk, end quote. As Casas continues, quote, rather than saying that it was a happy day when a Californiana married a Euro-American, as Bancroft and others have stated, a more appropriate statement might be, Happy was a day for the Euro-American man who married a well-connected Californiana and was willing to accommodate himself to her, life, to her family and culture, end quote. Charles Krug was lucky as he received land and found a place in history. In these marriages, Californianas acted as agents of cultural change and personal negotiations. Carolina Bale, however, isn't part of the generation of California women who married Anglo settlers as she married Krug in 1860. She is actually a product of one of those relationships that I think are missed in these historical accounts. The focus tends to be on the mother and not on the impact on, on the next generation. Coupling the Edward Turner Bale family papers with archives at the Napa County Historical Society, we know that Carolina Bale was born in 1841 in St. Helena, California. The exact date of her birth is unknown as I have yet to examine her baptismal records. 
We also know, as I mentioned, that Carolina Bale is a daughter of Edward Turner Bale and Maria Ignacia Soberanes. Um, Bale and Soberanes married in 1839. Carolina Bale had three sisters, Isidora, whose name is probably misspelled and was actually Isadora after her maternal grandmother, Ana and Juana Maria, and two brothers, Eduardo and Mariano. The Bale children were all born between 1839 and 1849, as Edward Turner Bale died that year of a fever, uh, caught while joining the gold rush. Carolina Bale, along with her siblings, were all born before the Mexican-American War, which means they were very young when California joined the Union in 1850. As a young child, Carolina Bale perhaps had to learn English in schools and became accustomed to a new legal, political, racial, and gendered system that surely affected her maternal side of the family. The younger Bale children attended boarding schools, as noted in correspondence letters from the 1860s. On one of the letters that Maria Ignacia Soberanes received, uh, this is a mother, from her son Mariano, he apologized for writing such short letter to his mother uh, as he has uh, a difficult time writing in Spanish. Mariano was one of the youngest who probably attended boarding schools, which meant he was uh, being schooled in English. Uh, and I wondered if that also happened to Carolina Bale, if she too began to lose her Spanish. Carolina Bale was 18 years old, eight years old when her father passed away. According to the will left by uh, her father, um, Maria Ignacia Soberanes, the Bale, the mother, was left in charge of the house, the land, any debt against them, and all the credit owed to him. As a widow and mother of four children, life must, must have been difficult for Carolina's mother. By 1856, however, Carolina's mother had married another Euro-American man named Edward Peabody, who also died two years later in 1858 during a travel to northern Mexico. Uh, Mrs. Peabody was once again a widow, but married for a third time, and she became Mrs. Ward. So while I was looking for Carolina Bale, I found a really interesting story about stories about her mother. Uh, on his will, uh, Edward Turner Bale left then eight-year-old Carolina the sawmill at the end of, its, of an existing contract in some 400 acres of land, more or less. Perhaps it was this land that came with her when she married Krug at the age of, uh, I'm sorry, I said 20, at the age of 19 on December 26, 1860. Um, again, he was 35 and she was 20 years old. They had five children, uh, three daughters, uh, Linda born in 1861, Anita born in 1868, mentioned as the prettiest, uh, and the only one who married, and Lolita, born in 1870. Two sons, Charles, uh, born in 1865, but died in 1866, and Carl, the youngest, was born in 1875. Uh, Carl and Anita are the only two who had children. Uh, Lolita and, and uh, Linda never married and were nurses. Of the several letters that her mother, Maria Ignacia Soberanes, received from relatives, Carolina's health was a topic of conversation. Carolina appears to have been an ill daughter as relatives constantly inquired about her well-being. Um, I also found that Carolina Bale was institutionalized at the Napa State Hospital, uh, which is where she died. The records that would have had her file uh, burned during the Napa State Hospital fire in the early 1900s. So when I say that, she's incredibly difficult to track down. She is incredibly difficult to track down. When I found out that she was at the state hospital, that she had been at the state hospital, um, I got really excited. But then I contacted the state hospital and they said, well, this place burned down. <laughs> so we don't know, right? Of course, there is still more archival research I need to complete for this moment. However, I am not too confident I will find much more. How then do I piece her story? Uh, where do we situate her? And how do we deal with a, frag uh, with a, fragmentary, uh, with a fragmented record? As Eula Taylor, uh, citing Cheryl Harris states, in relation to black women in the early 1900s, the black woman was, uh, quote, subject to be overlooked, misheard, misinterpreted, misrepresented, and ultimately misappropriated, end quote. Of course, Eula Taylor was researching, uh, was searching for Amy Jacques Garvey, the second wife of Marcus Garvey. Thus, continues Taylor, what appears to be a deficiency of information about Jacques in particular was actually the case for most black women. Uh, that is, under these conditions, it was difficult to be known via public records, essentially, one can speculate that uh, one, essentially one can speculate about Jacques' life only by contextualizing and drawing conclusions from the few tidbits of information she did share, end quote. We can then speculate about Carolina Bale's life, perhaps by looking at the lives of other women, descendants of Californians during the second half of the 19th century, and by the tidbits of information that we do find. 
This is a picture of an interview I conducted with uh, Mr. Placido Garcia, who arrived in Napa in the 1950s uh, and has been working in, the, in uh, Chateau Montelena since uh, 18, 1960s, and he calls it La, La Montelena. So the second moment I want to highlight begins in the 1940s with, with, with stories such as uh, Mr. Placido uh, Garcia's. Um, so the 1940s, with the arrival of Mexican Bracero workers, uh, brought uh, Mexican Bracero workers, including Alejandro Guerrero and Reynaldo Robledo, both whom left family in Mexico City and Michoacán, respectively, as the Bracero program only allowed arms and not the souls, love, or family. As temporary workers in the fields, or El Fil of Napa, this wave of Braceros worked for the Mandavis or the Christian Brothers, to mention a few. Reynaldo Robledo, for example, mastered grafting and was later hired to plant grapes. In a recent interview I, condu I conducted with his uh, granddaughter, Vanessa Robledo, she shared the joy she feels driving down Carneros or Carneros and seeing the vineyards as those are uh, the ones that her grandfather planted back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, 1950s and 60s. Um, this arrival also coincides with the arrival of four brothers, uh, Pascual de Aro, Feliciano de Aro, Enrique Segura, uh, Jose Manuel Salivar, uh, who came from Los Aro Zacatecas to the Napa Valley. They came during the Bracero program in the 1950s uh, when the Mandavi family requested four workers for their Charles Krug winery. Once chosen, the four brothers began their migration to and from Los Aro. When the four arrived in the valley, they decided that Napa reminded them of Jerez Zacatecas, uh, because it, and, and Los Aros Zacatecas because it had uh, an agricultural feel that was familiar to them. This is similar to what Vanessa Robledo shared about her grandfather. When Mr. Robledo arrived in Napa in the 1940s, it reminded him of Mexico. This is an interesting connection given that California, including Napa, was Mexican land once. As an agricultural town, Napa's employment was heavily seasonal. Men came to work during the late summer and early fall picking and crushing the grapes, they, they then returned home to Mexico, where they could attend uh, to their own land. That ability to move between uh, Napa and Mexico for what is called the crush became difficult in the 1990s when higher levels of border enforcement and a plethora of anti-immigration laws and regulations have severely restricted movement from north to south and back. The reliance of Mexican workers came in, uh, the reliance of Mexican workers came in handy after 1976. The Paris wine tasting of 1976 changed wine, winemaking, and tourism in the Napa Valley. This famous blind wine tasting contest put the Napa Valley on the map as a place able to produce superb wine and enabled it to become a favored tourist destination. This key moment is, also, is widely discussed in the literature, but the cheap labor that picks the grapes to make the wine is not. Paris 1976 coincided with Mexico's economic crisis of the late 70s and what is known as La Crisis of 1982. Mexican immigration to the Napa Valley has been relatively constant but circular since at least the 1940s, uh, and with work available, it became a preferred destination for Mexicans from Zacatecas, Jalisco, and Michoacán. The push from Mexico and the pull from Napa were synchronized to produce this flow of migrants. In the late 70s, however, few families were settling in Napa, the Mexican presses increased during the harvest or crush season and dissipates and dissipated after. The Mexican population increased to 3.1 percent by the by the end of the 1970s. So Paris wine taste, Paris uh, contest was in 76. By the end of the 1970s, we saw an increase in. Uh, so the Mexican population increased to seven to 3.1. The 1980s brought more Mexicans to the valley. The economic crisis of Mexico pushed migrants to Napa and their increased visibility, not only in the valley, but also in the US as a whole, led to amnesty under the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. IRCA sought to legalize immigrants who had resided in the US before January 1st, 1982, to penalize employers who knowingly hired undocumented workers and allowed agricultural workers to legalize their status through the Special Agricultural Workers Program. Under IRCA, over three uh, million Mexicans were able to legalize their status and apply for family reunification. This was reflected in the Napa Valley population, which increased to 8.7% by the 1980s, right? 3.1% in the 70s, 8.7% by the 1980s. 1986 also found a different meaning for the Napa Valley. In February of that year, a massive flood, not uncommon in Napa, in fact, since 1862, there have been 21 serious floods recorded, led authorities to decide that something needed to be done 
an athletic control plan, plan proposed in 1998, over 10 years after the 1986 flood, brought major changes to the city of Napa. With the flood protection plan, Napa City's downtown also began the process of revitalization. The downtown area is now a must stop for tourists en route to the wineries up valley. Napa began to demand service workers, bussers, dishwashers, valet parking attendants, hotel workers, all to cater and pamper the tourists. The Mexican immigrants filled these positions. By the end of the 1990s, the Mexican population was at 23.7%. And today's Napa Latino population is close to 40%, right? Why do these stories matter? A town that relies heavily on Mexican uh, immigrant labor to sustain itself continues to dismiss their presence. Aside from these murals, this is a mural, it's a little dark, but it's a mural that you can see on First Street, uh, uh, on First Street in Napa, and it's one of the earlier, it's one of the first murals uh, where we can begin to look at uh, other roots of Napa. Besides Charles Krug and the Germans and Italians, we can begin to see the Mexican presence, and of course, we can make the argument that I, in the narrative that I'm also sharing, I'm neglecting the indigenous presence, and that's part of a broader project that, that I'm doing. This is just, I'm, I'm tracing the Mexican presence. Uh, so this is a, a mural that we can find in, uh, in, in downtown Napa. It, it comes with a plaque uh, that explains who these people are. Uh, you can't see it on the map uh, very well, but uh, we have uh, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera in this mural, and I always wondered what are they doing there. They had nothing to do with the Napa Valley. There are some key figures, historical figures from Napa in, in that picture, but I have no idea what Frida Kahlo, and I'm a big fan of her and, and, and Diego Rivera. I just don't know what they're doing there. Um, this is uh, the plaque that explains. Uh, this is another mural uh, that's under a bridge near Juvenile Hall in, in, in Napa, completely away from a tourist uh, uh, site. I didn't know it was there until someone took me there. Uh, this is a closer image. Uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe is, is, in, is in that, is in that uh, picture, and, and this is just a closer. Uh, and this is a mural that uh, I'm happy to say that my sister uh, painted this one uh, in high school. This was her uh, high school project uh, in, in, in Napa back in 1993 when she graduated when she graduated from Napa High, and it is still there. They haven't uh, uh, um, erased the, the, the mural, but these are the, the few spaces where, where we can see the Mexican presence in, 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 uh, in the valley. Um, so, the Mexican presence, for the most part, remains invisible, despite the fact that the Latino population is close to 40%, a tourist can visit Napa and not encounter one single Mexican. This is strategic as Mexicans, particularly workers, are kept out of tourist spots. If they are present, they are only workers, therefore invisible to the eye. So let me, let me, let me wrap this up and bring it back to, uh, to Carolina Bale and to link her to Napa's Mexican presence. So why do these stories matter? In one of the chapters of Silencing the Past, Power in the Production of History, Michel Rolf Triot examines what he calls the three faces of Sans Souci, uh, 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 a figure in the Haitian Revolution, uh, the man and two buildings. Uh, only two Sans Soucis, the buildings, are recognized by historians. Sans Souci, the man, is silenced in Haitian history as he alters a narrative of the Haitian Revolution, since his story forces us to reread what Michel Rolf Triot calls a war within a war that was uh, the Haitian Revolution. Certainly, I'm not comparing Carolina Bale to Sans Souci, the man, but there is something to borrow in terms of methods and approach from Michel Rolf Triot. Charles Krug has two faces, the man during the second half of the 19th century and the Krug that was purchased by the Mondavis. There is a third figure uh, missing from the two Krugs, that of Carolina Bale. However, it is not only her historical silencing, silencing that concerns this presentation, but how the creation of an old world identity, German, French, and Italian, at the expense of silencing old California families of Napa, that points to the continuous silencing of Mexicans in present day Napa, has shaped um, and produced the image of the Napa Valley. Carolina Bale stands in the way of the old world roots in the Napa Valley planted by Krug the man and reinforced by the Mondavi family. Those roots are possible because of her and because of the legacy of her family. Recognizing those roots will then force us to understand or to unveil other silenced accounts, that of Chinese labor in the uh, uh, late 1800s, Indian land in the uh, 1700s before the arrival of the Spanish missions, and California history in the making of the Napa Valley. 
As Avery Gordon states, and I quote, to study social life, one must confront the ghostly aspects of it. This confrontation requires or produces a fundamental change in the way we know and make knowledge in our mode of production, end quote. The continuous production of the same narratives continues to yield the same results, and these same results are complicit in the continuous silencing of Mexicans and other racialized narratives in the Valley. It is Mexicans who presently sustain the Napa Valley, yet, like Carolina Bale has been silenced, so are Mexicans today. So how do we tell a different, so how do we tell a story in different ways? How do we retell, how do we retell a story in new ways is what I want to leave you with today. Thank you. So I, um, I close with this picture of uh, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, uh, Mr. Michael uh, Holcomb, uh, an incredibly powerful man in, uh, in the Napa Valley. He owns a lot of uh, um, property in downtown Napa that he rents out to, to, to restaurants. So I had the pleasure, I went to high school with his son, uh, Bobby. Uh, so uh, Michael Holcomb, uh, he's married to a Mexican woman and he wanted to uh, give back to a community that he feels has given him so much. Um, so, uh, with, uh, he, so with the uh, advice of his son Bobby, my friend Bobby, um, he purchased, he hired, um, oh, I can't remember his name, a, a sculptor uh, from the Bay Area to do these two uh, statues of Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. So he wanted to recognize the Mexican presence. Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez were both uh, in Napa uh, in the 60s and 70s and, and up until the 80s uh, doing organizing with field workers, with farm workers. Um, so Michael Holcomb ended up uh, purchasing these statues for, I think it was a over $100,000 and he placed them. Uh, he didn't want to bother with the politics of Napa in terms of where should we place these statues and he wanted them in, in the uh, Veterans Park, but he, he, he felt that it was gonna bring a bunch of polit politics that he didn't necessarily want to deal with. So he put him outside of his, uh, one of the buildings that he owns. So if you walk in, uh, in downtown Napa, you can see the statues uh, um, placed outside of a, uh, it's called Velo Pizza. So this is, uh, event was, uh, the statues were unveiled uh, almost a year ago and I had the pleasure and privilege of interviewing uh, six of the farm workers that are still alive that marched with Cesar Chavez uh, in the 60s and 70s and they were also recognized during, during this time. So we can make the argument that with the statues and the murals we are able to see the Mexican presence a little more but I, but I do think that, that um, you know, we need to think about beyond tourism and wine when we think about the Napa Valley. So, yes? Uh, the Napa Valley is a lot like Jackson Hole in the sense that the land is very, very expensive. Where, where do most of the workers live? What do they do for housing? They st uh, most of them still live in Napa. I have a lot of students from Jackson uh, at the University of Wyoming, and, I, and I, I, my thought is, my, I think the same way that there's a lot of parallels in terms of Jackson being a tourist. I don't know how many tourists visit Jackson. I think it's more than, than, than five to six million a, a year. Um, they live in, uh, some of them live in Napa. Uh, some of them live in the surrounding areas, Vallejo, uh, Fairfield, as far as Fairfield. So these are uh, you know, uh, folks that still have to commute to, um, to Napa for, for work, but a lot of them still live in Napa, but if they don't live in Napa, then they live in surrounding, in surrounding areas. Um, houses are, I mean, it depends on where you live or where you look, but houses uh, anywhere from half a mil and, and, and above, right? Yes? Uh, with the increase in uh, Hispanic population in California, won't, won't the Hispanic presence become bigger and bigger in places like California? What, it, California has become a majority state? Um, so, but we still have to think about who runs, like who runs Napa, in, you know, in, 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 uh, d despite the fact that close to half, 40% uh, of the population is, it's Latino, but specifically Mexican. Um, there is only one uh, Latino who was elected to be a city council, uh, a, a city council member, and this was in, in, I believe, in 2012. So we're still talking about, politically, a town that is still uh, very much, uh, run by non-Latinos. Um, I would like to think that we don't necessarily need Latinos to be running, you know, to be in public office for changes to be made. There's a lot of, you know, well-meaning, well-intended, good-hearted, you know, people in, 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 in Napa, but we still, like, uh, like in other places, we still, we, we don't have that legacy or history that 
for example, Los Angeles has, or, or even Oakland has, um, Napa is, 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 not, is, not quite, is not quite there yet. We can make the argument that the wave of Mexican immigration is, is a, you know, it's, it's a post 40s, 50s, and 60s, but we really saw a huge increase in the 80s and 90s. Um, so what, what I've noticed in the research that, I mean, I left Napa, I mean, I'm from there, but what I've also noticed is that a lot of uh, children, the, the generation that came after me, have returned to Napa, and they are the ones that are becoming active in, in, in uh, organizations, in, in, in politics, and, and I think that um, in, 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 I don't know, maybe hopefully five, 10 years, we're, we're gonna begin to see more changes in, in, in Napa, and we, we're gonna begin to see uh, more of a representation of Latinos overall in, in Napa, but I'm always curious and cautious in terms of how are we going to represent our history. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. It's like, oh, let's just make sure that we do it right. You know, not that I know everything, but I know a thing or two, you know. <laughs> Yes. Oh, there's one. One more. In, uh, so California becomes a state uh, very quickly because of the gold rush. Yes. There's a migration of Euro-Americans into um, uh, a region, a rich region of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Was there a corresponding, when, when that became part of the United States, was there a corresponding migration of the uh, native Mexican population southward. Well, when when uh, when the when the U.S. after the Mexican American War, Mexicans had but this was mostly in Texas. Like you know, they were given three options: you either become a U.S. citizen, you return to uh, Mexico, or you do nothing, and eventually you will become a citizen of the United States. Um, and a lot, there, there is, you know, his, and I'm not necessarily a historian, I play with history, but I'm not a, a, a historian by training. But historians have found that, that yes, some Mexicans uh, returned to, to, uh, to Mexico after uh, California became a state because it no longer, it, no, it, it was no longer home, or it no longer felt, felt um, familiar. But so yes, there, there, we did see that kind of migration going, you know, uh, south. Mm -hmm. I think that I saw another hand, no? All right. Oh, yes. I'm just curious about, you had mentioned that one of the things that you're going to, one of the things that you're going to be exploring is the indigenous part. Yes. So I'm just curious about that. Um, there is, um, I don't, I get, there is, just the same way that there is a particular trope when it comes to Carolina Bale, there is a similar uh, trope when it comes to the indigenous presence in, 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 in any historical account that you read about the Napa Valley. They were here, the, 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 the Wapos were here, and then, they're, and then they're gone. Like all of a sudden they disappear. And the same thing happens with the Chinese. The Chinese were the ones that were laboring the, the, in the vineyards in the uh, 1880s, right? And of course this was, uh, we can make the argument that the Chinese left uh, perhaps because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 um, and the consequences, uh, you know, that, that, uh, the consequences of that. Um, but I just, I don't like the way that historians, you know, uh, boosterous literature that pumps up the Napa Valley as this, and it is a lovely place. Um, the way that they tell the story, like here are the, the natives and then they go away, and then here are the Chinese and then they go away. The Californians were here and then we don't know what happened. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying, what I wanna do with, my, with, with, with this project, it's, it's gonna be a, 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 book, a book project on, of a contemporary, a comparative race relations in, in, in Napa. So looking at what are some of the lingering legacies of the indigenous population in Napa. I don't, and, and, um, and if I'm making the argument that um, Carolina Bale is not given a place in, in history, then I need to make the same argument for other racialized groups as well. So that's a methodological and an, and an epistemological argument that I'm gonna be making. Um, I, I do know that there's um, archives that, I mean, gosh, sometimes writers get really lazy and they don't look at, um, they, they don't do enough, enough, uh, enough research. There are, um, there is a museum uh, somewhere in, in, uh, in, in Berkeley, 
um, that I was pointed to, and the, one of the curators of that museum is an expert in, in, in the indigenous presence in, in the Napa area, in that area. So talking to, uh, speaking with him and, and, and looking for sources uh, that are, that are going to contribute to that history is, is one of the ways that I want to, that I want to um, approach that. Uh, there was a book that was published in, in, in the early 2000s by Linda Heidenreich, and it's called uh, this land was Mexican once, and she's a historian, and she's the first person that has written a critical account on 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 the Napa Valley. Um, but it, but it's it's a, it's an early it's an early history, um, it, and I, I love her work, and and, and I love Linda, um, I love Linda's work. Um, but the first thing that came to my mind when when I read the title of her of, of her book, this this land was Mexican once, I was like, well, that that land was native before. Right, so I think it's it's uh, complicating that that history of the Napa Valley and and doing a more representative account of race relations in Napa early on can perhaps uh, help us understand contemporary Napa today. So it's a it's a methodologically and, and epistemologically the approach that I'm going to take that's going to allow me to uh, incorporate not not simply add but tell a different story.